Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Kelly Writer's House. Thank you for your patience as we sort out combo poet time, death time, I've just heard it called, crip time. Yeah, we've got some ideas of time here. My name is Michelle Taransky. This is the Whenever We Feel Like It reading series. I am deeply honored to have poet Meg Day here. Meg um, did the keynote for the Disability Poetics Conference last semester. Um, I brought my students. Their keynote was amazing, um, giving me a lot of new frameworks to think about poetry and bodies and what we are able to say and do and be. I'm also excited to have Lauren Drake read to open up. Lauren um, took my writing seminar a few semesters ago, um, and I'm really excited to hear her work. Lauren will read, Meg will read, we'll have a reception. It'll be great. Thank you all for coming. Lauren Drake. Hey, I'm Lauren. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read uh, from an op-ed I wrote in Professor Taransky's class uh, called Please Don't Tell Me I Need to Be Fixed. In the fourth grade, my body stopped listening to me. My hands flapped, my feet kicked, and I squawked through classes. I hardly took notice. Everyone else did. My mother drove me from pediatrician to psychologist to specialist in search of an elusive diagnosis. Each one proposed their own crafted cure for me to try. My classmates began to whisper. The moms of the soccer team would greet me with clinical scrutinization as I walked off the field, wondering, what can we do about that? I offered no reply but a squeal. The stares and comments followed my quick, jerking movements, but then my body began to, dis to disobey in other more terrifying ways that no one else seemed to notice. I crumpled and spit on every load of fresh laundry my mom carried up to my room, feeling contaminated by its cleanliness. I ducked past the front door in the mornings, certain that someone was going to shoot me through the window. I fled from the sound of a crinkling wrapper, convinced that gum, of all things, was going to poison me. Almost 12 years later, after a diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome in the eighth grade, shortly followed by a diagnosis of OCD, I am still navigating both as a junior in college. Tourette's causes my body to tick in the form of many rapid, repetitive movements and sounds. My ticks draw an audience of sudden experts who often have little to no understanding of my actual condition. Many people are quick to notice visible abnormalities, and some are quick to assume that they should do something about them. My friend down the hall has encouraged me to take medication or try smoking weed. My aunt's co-worker warns my mother that I have epilepsy in her hospital right away. They interject with the best of intentions, offering their understanding of help. However, I have no desire to eradicate Durettes from my body. The implication that I require treatment at their unsolicited recommendation is inherently ableist. Ableism is the idea that everyone must conform to one standard of ability. Anyone who doesn't satisfy this uniform convention is considered inferior. While it mainly sprouts from ignorance, it thrives in the comments strangers make to me and burrows in my doctor's eyebrows when I say I'm not interested in medicating. I hear it in every voice that questions my ability to make basic choices for myself as a disabled person. I am uncomfortable with the audacity of those who assume that just because I am noticeably different, I should alter my body to conform. Regardless of good intentions, these seemingly harmless remarks undermine my ownership of my disability. People comment on my Tourette's but few recognize that I also have obsessive compulsive disorder. The majority of children with Tourette's experience symptoms of at least one other condition, including ADHD, OCD, or depression. Often these disorders prove to be far more disruptive to a person's functioning than Tourette's. While my visible Tourette's may appear challenging at a glance, I personally consider mine to be an inconvenience. Unlike Tourette's, my invisible OCD has hindered my ability to function. Very few people are aware of the years of effort that have gone into my OCD treatment so that I can function on a day-to-day -day basis. Frightening, nonsensical, intrusive thoughts and repetitive compulsive behaviors devoured hours of my day before I sought out an intensive treatment program. Through therapy, I have been incredibly successful minimizing my OCD symptoms, but it has taken a lot of long-term personal investment to do so. At times, it was difficult to explain the missed classes in tears to my teachers and peers. If I didn't speak up, no one had a clue why or if I was even struggling. Navigating the explanations of my OCD was terrifying in the beginning, but it taught me to speak for myself. In this sense, OCD has afforded me one luxury my Tourette's does not. 
just introduced itself there. The only people aware of it are those I choose to tell. When I do, my voice is the first to speak. Now at the University of Pennsylvania, over five hours from my home in Pittsburgh, the need to vocalize is more crucial than ever. Every day I push back against the demanding voice of OCD, in my scribbled notes documenting irrational thoughts and compulsions, in my Friday march to Market Street for treatment, and the deep inhales I force myself to take when I catch a whiff of chewing gum. OCD wasn't vanquished the minute I received a congratulatory construction paper card on my last day of intensive outpatient therapy. There are still times when I want to stay down on the floor and shut out every smell, sight, and sound. Regardless, when I sit down in a 100-seat lecture, I can't help but remember the days when I could barely manage attending a 40-minute class without fleeing the room in tears. I'm constantly aware of how incredible it is to be attending college away from home and how diligently I must advocate for myself for it to remain that way. I'm no longer in a grade of 30 students at a high school where every teacher stopped to talk to me in the hallway. I must speak louder than ever just for my professors to learn my own name, let alone communicate the challenges that I face in the classroom. While I am one person on a swarming campus of 10,000, I still strive to approach peers and professors individually and discuss my experiences with a degree of personal authority. With every new confidant, I explain my OCD on my own terms. I do not hold the same power with my Tourette's. I welcome questions about my Tourette's and have no issue discussing it. But when someone approaches me and urges me to change, I cringe. They are caught on the tug of my lips, the twist of my neck, or the scrunch of my nose. Why should my body be expected to conform just because I draw the attention of able-bodied people? I am a whole, rational, strong person. I need no still limbs or quiet tongue to know this. Of course, I am only one person of millions with Tourette's syndrome or OCD. Every disabled person has their own experience and opinion of their disability, and each is uniquely equipped to make their own decisions. Every disabled person should have access to the level of treatment they desire. However, to push disabled individuals to actively pursue a full scope of treatment that may not even be right for them is to silence their authority over their own bodies. Tourette's is a part of my body, as is OCD. I've grown in this jerking, grunting assembly of limbs and neurons. I am most equipped to make decisions for it. In the past, I have found that Tourette's medications have unwanted side effects, and while cognitive behavioral therapy can be useful for its more unpleasant symptoms, it can be time-consuming and frustrating. Though I tell inquirers that I am fine with my Tourette's and would rather concentrate my efforts on managing my OCD, some still question my choices. They are both unable to comprehend my situation and unable to accept that I, as a disabled person, know what is best for me more than they do. Struggling to carry a carton of eggs through a grocery store is something I can easily live with. Facing daily panic attacks isn't. Every time a person sees me tick and asks, can't you stop that? The voice of ableism, conscious or not, threatens my own. No, I speak up. With my arms filling, I just keep walking. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I have to do like an internet shout out to Jennifer Bartlett, um, who introduced me to the disability column in the New York Times opinion section existing by writing some beautiful pieces. And Lauren and I were able to work together um, for Lauren to write that beautiful piece. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we will hear from Meg Day. We have copies of their most recent book and a beautiful broadside made by the Common Press, Robinson Press at Kelly Writer's House. Um, if there's time at the end, we will do a short q and I'll check in with Meg. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming, and let's welcome Meg Day. I hope the q and is real long. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, Lauren, what? Thank you for letting me read with you tonight. That was beautiful and, and empowering and, um, and really necessary. So thank you. Can we clear it for you again? I would like that. Thank you. Um, it's really lucky, I think. It's a lucky, lucky thing to, to get to read with Ken. So I appreciate it. Um, and thank you also to everyone who made tonight possible, the staff here and all of the tech folks in the rear with the cameras and whatnot, and the staff here at the house, and Michelle, of course, thank you, um, and to the Topes. I'm grateful that you're here. Um, I'm going to read 
I won't read for too long um, so that we have lots of time to talk. Um, I'm just going to read a few poems from the book. Um, last time at sea level is, is getting on um, in years. And um, it's, it's done me right in many, many ways. Um, the book came out in 2014 and uh, has, has more than earned its keep. And um, I try not, lately, I've tried not to read too much from the book simply because um, I favor it. And favoring the book keeps me from finishing the next one. So I'm just going to read a few poems um, from last time at sea level. And um, the, uh, the interpreters didn't get these poems, so I apologize. <laughs> I like to keep it fresh and real up here. <laughs> um, the only thing that you need to know about this text is that uh, when I first started writing these poems, I had just moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, from Oakland in California, and was experiencing all kinds of shock, culture shock, um, the shock of geography. Um, and I had never been landlocked before, and I had never seen it snow. There's snow in the west, and there's snow in the east, and there's snow in our beds icing the cabbage. Since you left me alone, the wasness swallowing the bulb in the porch light has gone leaden, and each night the asphalt is honeycombed in its half-lidded light, while the laundry, frozen stiff on the line, sways from its hinges like the moon flag that waves without wind. I'm not praying, I'm longing, please. Let summer be a good shot, an untraceable track. Let the beautiful animal of this working class winter loose its vice grip on your throat before the kill. The kettle is steaming the windows, lined with bubble wrap, and the peaches are ripening in their cans. Come home, come home. Him to a landlocked God. Perhaps as a child, you too saw these stallion clouds and knew a sky with no blue was a sky too reverent to be overlooked or understood. Perhaps heaven is the moon flag, not the moon, and you came to know praise as vertical only because the earth refused your reach. Look up. There's a tear in the sky tonight like the shriek of a frightened mare or the long wail a saxophone makes on a corner at dawn. And this is how I know you are a woman. We are both broken in two by our own creations. I have looked to the west in search of water and the sheer faces of so many boulders stare back, their bodies bent in genuflection at the altar of the sky. Why have you made me know the sea? Make me a bird, Lord, make me a man. Make me a barn with a spine so swayed it pulls back my neck to crane toward the sky. How are we doing? Are we gonna make it through one more of these? There are a few more than one. Um, the funny thing about this book, or I don't know that it's funny, it's funny to me now, years later. Uh, was how much resistance I got for, um, you know, being a queer person or being a part of the queer and trans community and, and writing uh, what I was told were, were divinity poems, um, poems that reference some sort of God or, or Lord or use the language of religion in some sort of, um, in a way that was seemed, I think, that a way that was deemed uh, appropriative because, of course, um, you know, like queer and trans folks don't have religion question mark um, and so the the pushback that I received for, for a, a lot of this book um, was surprising to me um, and sort of um, peaked uh, with this one poem that I'm going to read uh, that's written after John Donne and you know John Donne was like not the kid that I wanted to fall in love with in my PhD right like the like the poets that I came up reading and the poets that I have access to, uh, like you know, like the dead white dudes, was not like who I was aiming for um, to fall in love with. And you know, John Donne's he's a complicated John Donne is a complicated fellow. Um, but what I wanted, short, long story short, what I wanted to do was take Donne and bring him back, um, and share him 
with people with whom I came up or the communities that I came up alongside. Um, and when I read a poem um, like Better My Heart, Three Person God, uh, I think like, God, that's just like the gayest shit I've ever read. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, anyway, so I'm going to read this poem. It's called Better My Heart, Transgender God. And I, it's the poem, until recently, until this trans memo that came out um, in the last year, this trans memo, which if you don't know anything about, you should, you should read up on. Um, but until the trans memo came out, this was the poem that I received the most hate mail for uh, as a poet, which is nice. seems like an, an oxymoron or something that a poet would get hate mail. But um, there were a lot of really angry people that I'd sort of taken up divinity, but then I'd also involved John Donne. Um, and then last year I went to Switzerland to the, uh, to the International John Donne Conference and read this poem. <laughs> Had a lot of really exciting conversations with a lot of very passionate people. Um, but, I, but I left Switzerland feeling emboldened, so I'm going to keep reading the poem. Um, this is Better My Heart, Transgender God. Better my heart, transgender God, for yours is the only E that hears. Place fear in my heart, where faith has grown my senses dull and reassures my blood that it will never spill. Show every part to every stranger's anger. Surprise them with my drawers full up of maps that lead to vacancies and chart the distance from my pride, my core, terror, do not depart. But nest in the hollows of my loins and keep me on all fours, my knees, bring me to them. Force my head to bow again. Replay the murders of my kin until my mind's made new. Let Adam's bite obstruct my breath till I respire men and press his rib against my throat until my lips turn blue. You, O oh duo, O oh twin, whose likeness is kind, unwind my confidence and noose it round your fist so I might know you in vivid impermanence. Um, so the, the next couple poems I'm going to read are all... How y'all doing over here? You gonna make it? You've seen these. <laughs> A few of them at least. Um, so the, the, pro the project that I'm working on now is uh, very much rooted in the last few years of sort of this um, disabled and deaf uprising of, of dis and deaf poets and writers coming together and sort of pushing back in, in many small ways, but in large political ones also, and sort of trying to um, restake uh, our claim on our own lives and our own stories. And um, it's been a real joy, actually, to find kinship and um, the labor has been um, exciting and fruitful and, um, I just feel very, very grateful at this moment in history to be among community um, at such a terrifying time in the world and in history. Um, but so this book sort of comes out of realizing sort of late in the game, um, sort of mid PhD maybe, um, that I had been writing poems assuming that all of my readers were hearing. Uh, and, and I knew that because I had been memorizing hearing rhymes uh, which is not a thing I can hear. <laughs> um, and so I was memorizing hearing rhymes, trying to sort of like assimilate and fit into, acculturate myself into English poetics, right? We know what it is that sounds good to us. And when I say we, I really mean you, um, hearing folks, right? Hearies are, it's not just rhymes that you like. You're very particular, <laughs> right? You like diphthong, like what? I can't hear one sound, but now I have to hear two at once. Um, <laughs> It just seemed like a lot of labor. It was like ludicrous, right? I'm in the graduate lounge, like memorizing rhymes um, so that I can be published in places and have conversations with people and be a part of American poetics. But aren't I an American poet? Um, and so this next project is really trying to unlearn a lot of that and trying to unlearn what hearing hmm, what hearing poetics has has offered me consensually otherwise, and then also trying to figure out like, what is deaf poetics when writing in English? What is deaf poetics when you read aloud in English? Um, and is there space for 
American Sign Language on the page, is there space for interpretation or translation? And what does that look like politically? Um, and so this book is very much, oh, I just called it a book. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, this project is, um, is really trying to, to grapple with, um, with many of those issues and, and trying to do it in a way um, that isn't ashamed to say I was wrong. That isn't, um, that isn't at all careful of, about saying, look, I did this thing for a long time and look at where it got me, right? Like this book has taken me very literally around the world um, and given me a job and I get to teach poems for a living. Um, and so what does that mean then to sort of go back and say, ooh, I, I got this wrong, I messed up. Um, and so part of that is making amends certainly to my lineage and to my culture, but part of it too is, is saying to the kin who are coming up alongside me and who are coming up as my students, uh, we can do better for you. We don't have to accommodate you, we can anticipate you. Um, so that's where these poems are coming from. I'm just gonna read a couple of them. Does that sound all right, y'all? <laughs> y'all are like, mm, we're stuck here, okay. <laughs> Obad today. Last night I dreamt I'd forgotten my name or driven it off like a fox through the split rail and into the long grass that can't help but divulge the direction of the wind. More than once I've been without and more than once I've run my padded bones along the braided bottom teeth of summer, confusing heat with light and feeling for the peak that christens predators with sharper tongues than prey. There are some shades of night so tender they swallow sound without chewing. Pretend this is the first time you've seen me crouch and tuck my hands under the resting scaffold of a body limp with sleep or worse. Pretend your teeth don't pull flesh from the peach's pit the way maggots eat around the tendons that hold the heart inside the chest of the fawn felled by a fox in the soundless down of that black yard. Where is the sun? Look at the long grass open like a wound where this small life left an even gentler night. Can you see its blood cross the door of my chest like a promise? Can you hear me screaming my last name into its neck as if it would turn the earth? Um, this next poem I'm gonna read is part of a series, and this will be the only poem from the series that I read, but um, how many of y'all are reading Gabriel Cavacaresi? Oh, get your life right. <laughs> um, so Gabby, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> but Gabby Calvacaresi Calver just came out with this book uh, called Rocket Fantastic. And um, in it, the, the sort of the character, the main character, I don't know, does a book of poems have a protagonist? Um, the person, the being in the book, uh, doesn't use pronouns. And instead of a pronoun, Gabby has replaced the pronoun with a, a sort of a, what is it, like a musical insignia? And when Gabby reads these poems aloud, when the insignia shows up, uh, Gabby takes a deep inhale. <sighs> and that becomes sort of the representative reference point, reference point or the pronoun for, for this character. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that. What would it mean? Uh, you know, ASL doesn't have pronouns, not in the way that English does. Um, which has been great for me up until now. <laughs> um, and thinking about what does it mean then to be called a thing you can't hear and, and does it matter, right? Everybody's always like, what are your pronouns, Meg? And it's like, mm, I can't hear you same anyway, so what do I care? I mean, I do care, but anyway, so thinking about um, that, that replacing factor of what does it mean to swap out something that is true for me um, with something that is true for you. And so this series comes um, in the form of uh, repetitive brackets that say inaudible. Kind of like, uh, what's it, like closed captioning, you know, like at the bottom. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't, okay. Um, <laughs> there's, there's often closed captioning available. Um, like on the television, so when something, when you can't hear something, but it's the sound of not being able to hear something, apparently, it says inaudible. <laughs> so it's the sound of not being able to hear something. Anyway, 
<laughs> Y'all are giving me trouble back here. Okay. Um, so the series is using this, and this poem is called Portrait of My Gender as Inaudible. That was a long story. I knew I was a god when you could not agree on my name. And still none you spoke could force me to listen closer. Is this the nothing the antelope felt when Adam lit on his own entitling dubbed family, genus, species? So many descendants became doctors, delivered babies, bestowed bodies names as, to, to, as if to say it is to make it so. Can it be a comfort between us, the fact of my creation? I was made in the image of a thing without an image, and silence, too, is your invention. Who prays for a god except to appear with answers, but never a body, a voice? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me because I was the one to say it. On the first day, there was no sound worth mentioning. If I, too, am a conductor of air, the only praise I know is in stereo. One pair, an open hand, and closed fist will have to do. I made a photograph of my name. There was a shadow in a field, and I put my shadow in it. You can't hear me, but I'm there. Try to just read one more. Does that feel good? Two, two more, all right. <laughs> when the women in the front agree. Um, are y'all familiar with this, uh, this artist, Louise Bourgeois? Yeah, right? What a weirdo, that kid. Um, so in 2016, I was abroad on the Amy Lowell, uh, which is a, a very generous fellowship given to uh, one American poet a year where the only real rule is that you have to be off the continent of North America for 365 consecutive days, um, which is great if you like to be told what to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, it, it was a troubling year. It was a hard year to be abroad, right? Like 2016 was an election year, and it was a year where we saw sort of a huge spike in, in refugee movement, refugee crises, um, and, um, and also, um, I saw a, real, a lot of really rad art um, while living abroad. And Louise Bourgeois sort of like followed us, weirdly. It was like every country we went to, there was Louise. Um, and became sort of this site of comfort because Louise uses a lot of, I mean, to her credit, she, she, perhaps a lot of her art is ableist, right? She uses a lot of like dis disembodied limbs and uses women's bodies in very bizarre ways um, that I don't feel sophisticated enough to speak to. But um, she does have an obsession with hands. And um, I feel quite an attachment, obviously, through ASL to, to the idea of hands. But then to see so many instances of disembodied hands was just, I was just like, oh, this is for me, right? Which is what we think about all art, I'm sure. It's either for me or not for me. I don't know, whatever. Um, but there's this one piece called 10 AM is when you come to me. And it's, um, it's probably twice as high as this wall here. Um, and about as, as wide. And it's um, panel after panel after panel of um, outlines and then solid uh, prints of arms, hands, crossing one another. Um, and I think the implication is that uh, 10 AM is when you come to me. It's about this relationship between the artist and her assistant, uh, which could mean a number of things. So this is after the uh, 2006 piece by Louise Bourgeois. 10 AM is when you come to me. In some other life, I can hear you, breathing. A pale sound like running fingers through tangled hair. I dreamt again of swimming in the quarry and surfaced here when you called for me in a voice only my sleeping self could know. Now the dapple of the aspen respires on the wall and the shades cut its song a staff of light. Leave me, that me in bed with the woman who said all the sounds for pleasure were made with vowels I couldn't hear. Keep me instead with this small sun that sips at the sky blue hem of our sheets then dips and reappears, a drowsy penny in the belt of Venus, your aureole nodding slow and copper as it bobs against cotton in cornflower or clay. What a waste the groan of the mattress must be. 
when you backstroke into me and pull the night up over our heads. Your eyes are two moons I float beneath. And my lungs fill with a wet hum, your hips return. It's Sunday, or so you say, with both hands on my chest. And hot breath is the only hymn whose refrain we can recall. And then you reach for me like I could have been another man. You make me sing without a sound. That was beautiful. Um, this last poem I'm going to read, uh, I, I wrote while I was living in Malta uh, on, the, on the Lowell. And Malta is a bizarre, a bizarre place. Um, it's a wonderful and beautiful place. Um, and uh, at the time, it was about halfway through the year. And at the time, um, I felt so displaced that really the only thing I could write about was outer space. It was, like the only, it was like the thing that felt closest to me <laughs> somehow. Um, and it, this was right around the time that, um, that Pluto, right, was like in renegotiations, <laughs> um, right? Because Pluto was like a planet and then not a planet. And then for a, for a while we forgot about Pluto and then suddenly it was like, okay, fine, Pluto, you can like kind of be a planet if you want, but not really, <laughs> right? Anyway, this is a poem for Pluto. Y'all have been very, very kind. I hope that we get to talk a little bit after this. It's called, If You're Staying, I'll Stay Too. Maybe it's easier, having been named after someone. Nobody expects that you'll rule the underworld or judge the dead, but they call you Pluto anyway. Planet, too. I know a girl like you, who used to be a thing she isn't anymore, but hasn't changed at all, whose orbit, didn't circle straight, whose size and distance never quite seemed right, but no one cared till now. I was a woman once, rounded by my own gravity, catcalled into Hades by men who could not see this gem of a hard rock was not made magnetic for the likes of them. Hey, little mama, don't take it so hard. So we are frigid. So we stay relegated out here with our kin. I'll wear my fade tight and my tie loose if you play your radio loud. They say we're known only in comparison to that which surrounds us, so I'd guess they'll hear our signal soon. I was a woman once, but that's not the farthest thing from the sun another universe might have let me be. Another universe might have let us be. Thank you all. Should we chat? Your reading reminded me of something that happened when I was teaching at Barnard. Uh, I was on a faculty committee to decide whether American Sign Language could be counted as a foreign language. Uh -huh. And there were people on that committee who were convinced that it should not be allowed because American Sign Language didn't have its own culture associated to it. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what an ignorant point of view. But I would be interested to know what you would think about that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that I agree with you. Um, but I also, I think that it shouldn't be taught as a foreign language because it's a domestic one. Um, yeah, I think I, it's, a, it's an odd m moment. How long ago was this? Ah, yeah. So when I was in college, I was an undergrad at University of California, San Diego. Um, and, and worked with Professor Michael Davidson to change the UC system's understanding of whether or not ASL counted as their language and literature requirement. Um, and the argument at that time, which was in the early aughts, um, the argument at that time was not that it didn't have culture, but that it didn't have literature, um, which is also hilarious and ignorant, um, but in like the ha-ha, we're crying kind of way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there's any question that ASL uh, 
is a is a legitimate language, has a legitimate li literature. Um, what I think is is of more dire consequence maybe is the part where m young folks are encouraged to learn it, young hearing folks are encouraged to learn ASL in high school and in college and it fulfills this requirement. It seemed as, is seen as sort of this enriching, um, I don't know, part of like self-discovery and or a favor one does as out of maybe not maybe not charity. That's not really what I mean, but sort of like, oh, wouldn't that be nice if one day you're in the grocery store and you can sign to somebody, <laughs> you know? It's not um, seen as a practical choice. It's not like, oh, you'll go study abroad somewhere or you will work with a particular population. It's not seen in the same way. Um, where simultaneously we have young deaf folks who are being refused sign language um, and are being oralized and mainstreamed, have no access to language at all. Um, so, th so the disparity there seems to me severe and dangerous, where it is that in, in one realm, it's sort of this um, party trick, right? Like how many people do you know that know, you know the alphabet in ASL versus very, very, um, oh, it's just like, significant consequences on a person's experience as a human being to not have access to language simply because uh, we want them to assimilate into hearing culture. Um, and I could speak uh, on and on and on to the statistics around all of that, but um, I think that's really where we're at. I don't think, thankfully, I don't think we're arguing necessarily all of the time for ASL to be uh, taken seriously as a language, but what are the ramifications of how we really feel about it? So, but that's fantastic. Thank you for your labor. The funny thing for me was that the scientists were much more in favor of American Sign Language, whereas it, the, skeptic, the skepticism came from the English department, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I was. Didn't yeah, understand. And, and so it is with they, them pronouns, right? <laughs> It's always, it's a, as, some, as a member of the, an English department, right? It's always that sort of territorial, um, not in our yard, right. right? We've got the dead white dudes on our side, and they <laughs> say no. You know, even though they, them pronouns, and ASL, well, not necessarily ASL, but French sign language or, or signed languages have been around for like, you know, gorboons of eons. Um, yes. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Hi. Um, thank Hi. you. Hi. Thank you so much uh, for being here and for reading. It was really wonderful. Um, I guess I have a question about um, earlier when you said that um, you know when art is uh, for you or not for you or like you have the experience. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel the same way in a way, but I am also queer and disabled and a person of color. And a lot of the times I uh, take in media um, with racist um, or sexist or homophobic um, parts to it. And, um, there's something else about the media that um, that speaks to me in my, not that I'm excusing it for having that, but um, I just wonder if the um, inspiration, the media that inspires you, um, if you find that it speaks to you or that it is for you and that it um, identifies with however you identify yourself or um, or if there's something else. Yeah, I, thank you. I love that question because I, I think you're tapping at a, th a thing, hmm, how to say, right? You, you, you've you approached the great issue of who is art made for, for whom is art made, rather. Um, and if it is that art is made um, sort of like in the realm of like for us, by us, right? In, in dis spheres, dis and deaf spheres, that would be, right, nothing about us without us. Um, what does that really say, given that we don't 
consistently and regularly see or, or experience or have access to dis and deaf artists. Um, yeah, sorry, disabled and deaf artists. Um, as is the case with queer and trans artists. I mean, less so, I think. Um, but out and qu queer and trans artists or um, artists of color or, right, like we know these things. We know how hegemonic power systems work, et cetera. Um, I like your question, especially because of the Louise Bourgeois. I have no idea how Bourgeois identifies. Um, I'm just gonna like take a guess and say she's not deaf. Um, and yet she has this relationship with her hands, right? And so I'm very, very interested in that. Like, what does it mean to be um, a non-deaf person invested in hands when it is that hands, my hands are everything, right? I mean, like not in this particular moment, but well, even in this particular moment, right? I don't even have to use them for them to be everything. Um, and so I do think that there's something interesting happening. I'm not gonna be very good at answering this question, but I think there's something really, really exciting about what you're proposing or what I'm projecting onto your, your question or statement, which is that we get to take back power wherever and whenever we can. And I think that that's part of my I hadn't thought about it as inspiration, but that's part of that move, right? It's like, oh, Louise Bourgeois, I see what you're doing, and also maybe we should do it this way, right? To, to contribute, to add a voice, uh, whatever voice means, but to really enter into conversation and get to say, he tonight, or you know, at a reading in Minnesota, or wherever, in front of however many people, look at how it is that we need to think about our bodies differently. If it is that like my hands can be everything, um, what are you doing with your hands? And how does that affect my access, right? So yeah, I'm really, really excited by that question and interested in it. And I don't, I don't know that I have anything all that intelligent to say about it, but I think that the engagement with it and the critique of it and you know, just curiosity is really, really crucial. Um, answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I could ask or comment something, oh, but I don't need to. Can I ask a question? Yes. Again, um, my question's for Lauren. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about, about your piece, and I'm thinking also about the way that Michelle framed sort of, you know, y'all's working together in, um, in this moment where we have the New York Times disability uh, series or section. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how it is that you navigate in the space of, how it is that you navigated in the space of like writing this essay, um, what to disclose, how to disclose it, um, and what that, what that process has been like for you as somebody who is very much uh, a part of the sort of, I think, like the freshest edge of the dis and death rights movement. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess in terms of the experience of disclosing um, information about my disabilities, I used to be very closed off about that. I did my best to suppress all of that information. I only ever really told one person outside of my family about it for a very long time. Um, I was mm -hmm. both kind of ashamed and felt, well, if I put this information out there, people are already, you know, people who already see me differently because they can see my threats, they see my tics, they're going to see me even more differently when they find out that I have obsessive compulsive disorder and there's all sorts of stereotypes about that mm -hmm. and people begin to treat you differently. Um, and then I think after I went through my first round of treatment and I went back into struggling, I kind of hit this point where I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm in control. Like, 
I don't, I don't, I can just tell people mm -hmm. how I feel. I have the control to tell people my story my way rather than mm -hmm. have them define it for me. And so I found that, you know, people come up to me kind of horrified, like you talk about your experiences so openly, what's this going to do to you? I think it's better to exist radically and be open with people about those experiences in the hope that we can become more open as a community in, in talking about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess disclosure is, is a sign or kind of destigmatizing. Yeah, I, I don't think disclosure is for everyone because if you're already struggling and navigating this yourself, putting that out to everyone else is going to just make things more confusing. But if you're in a place where you know yourself and you know that you're going to be okay, I think that disclosing is sort of a radical act and letting people know that you're out there, you're living this, and you're still able to live the life that you want. And I think that's really important for people to know. So that's, I guess, where I was coming from when I wrote that piece. And do you have kinship here at UPenn? Yeah, I, um, I run a chapter of an organization called Project Let's, um, which is more on the range of mental illnesses and experiences with that. Um, but it's just a community for folks to get together and talk about these things because there aren't a lot of spaces on campus for that, I feel. Mm -hmm. That's just exclusively for people who, who live this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought that that was important to have um, because it's important to bring the greater community into that conversation, but it's also important to have designated spaces for people with lived experience because there's definitely a form of kinship in that, that, um, you know, you can talk about your shit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for doing that labor. Thank you for speaking here tonight. Oh, can I still ask a question? <laughs> I was just wondering, um, with your identities, both as a trans person and as a disabled person, have you ever felt the need to suppress parts of your identity as you're proceeding in your professional life and in academia? Um, or are you just sort of doing your best to exist radically and um, putting yourself out there? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, Yes, yes. I mean, like, I definitely, I can start first and foremost with the poems, right? I think that um, in many spheres of, of the academy, um, queer folks at least um, have, hmm, I don't want to say that there's been progress, because it's not exactly progress, but they, there's a way in which you can talk about being queer in the academy because there's, like, queer studies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, it's not at all easy and obviously, like, intersecting identities with queerness is, like, a hot mess. Um, but there is, there is space in the academy for queerness, at least in an academic projection, right? Um, at the same time that when I went on the job market, for example, I was explicitly told to not state um, my sexuality, gender, identity, or uh, disability status. Um, and we know why, right? It's not that it wasn't, well, one, it was non-disabled folks advising me, right? Because who has disabled mentors? Mm -hmm. Elders, where are you? I mean, we have them, right? But they're so very rarely our professors. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were non-disabled folks advising me to, to be non-disabled and non-queer and non-trans and whatever on paper, um, which was like just really not an option for me. Um, both like the part where I have to show up to a campus interview and like be this kid. Um, it's not the kind of surprise you want to like toss at somebody. And then also because of access, right? It's not as if access is like this thing that just happens. Like this shit took some organizing and funding and you know, praise be the folks who made it happen. And also you can't just say, I'm just gonna roll up and it's gonna be fine. I'm gonna have access and even, how many times have I been with Ken? Even, even here, even here at the Disability Poetics Symposium, you, you show up to a place that you've been told is accessible, and it's like the ground floor doesn't actually exist on the ground. Right? Or like there's, there's one step, and it's like there's no, there's no thought process through like what one step means for someone on wheels. Um, so it's just like very basic misunderstanding of what access actually means. Um, 
Like, we didn't have an access statement here tonight, but we could have one now, right? Uh, this one room is mostly glass, which makes it sort of like auditorily impossible. Thank goodness for the interpreters. Um, the building itself is accessible. We have hard floors. The chairs are movable. You all can get up and leave whenever it is that you need to. The lights, I imagine, for some people are awful and for others, perfect, right? <laughs> I mean, like, right, it's, the access statement is not meant to say, like, look at all of the things that you have done wrong. It's not like we're going to do with the clipboard, right? And also, it's to draw attention to the fact that spaces that are meant for communities are not meant for all community. Um, <laughs> And also to remind people that like bodies are bodies. If you need to get up and like do jumping jacks, go on with your bad self, right? Um, so things like that, I think, have really, really um, prevented mentorship in the way of disclosure. Absolutely. Um, and I just don't. I think I've gotten better over time. I felt more empowered over time. Um, I feel less afraid of you know things like using the ADA or like. You know, I finally read the ADA. Mm -hmm. That was a good idea. Um, and finding out, you know, all of the things that go into to access and all the ways in which the ADA, which has been around since 1990, has failed us, as mm -hmm. if it's supposed to be the end all be all. Um, I do think that there is uh, a very tiny but very fierce contingent, contingent of of faculty and artists and writers and activists and civil workers and you know everybody who's sort of really coming together to figure out how to mentor this next generation and how to mentor each other um, which has been joyful and painful and um, I think I think we could get it right you know um, but it's gonna hurt for sure um, but we've been hurting for a really long time, so I think that discomfort on the part of non-dis folks is a little overdue. Oh. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, audience, for your questions. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you, Heidi, Anthony, everyone at Kelly Writer's House that makes this stuff possible. Um, thank you to Meg, the Disability Poetics Conference, for teaching me that interpretation and access is not automatic. It costs money. Um, and thanks to people like Lauren for doing this kind of work at Penn and hopefully poetry, though poetry might be 50 years behind other fields. Um, hopefully Kelly Writer's House is getting it right, will get it right. Um, and. We can all do this together. Um, thank you, guys. We'll have a reception, broadsides, books, talk to writers. Thank you so much for coming. And don't forget to check the calendar. Mind of Winter is tomorrow. Five up on Walt coming up. Five poets talking about Walt Whitman. So many things. There's probably a chili cook-off coming. Look at the calendar. Don't miss it. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>